uh, where we're dealing with matters in relation to the uh, banking sector. And we're joined today by Cormac Butler, who has been with us before, and Mr Tim Bush, uh, who will give their opening statements, and then we will be in a position to raise the various matters with, with both. Uh, before going to the um, statements, I want to advise witnesses, by virtue of section 17.2i of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence in con uh, connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons, or entity, by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise, or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make them uh, identifiable. So, Mr Butler, would you like to proceed with your opening statement, please? Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting us here to speak about the banking sector, its impact on Ireland's housing crisis and the role of vulture funds. For 20 years, I have advised on financial institutions' risk in London and globally. I wrote books on risk management and financial instruments um, and trained over 100 bank regulators globally. I gave evidence to two UK House of Commons inquiries. I am joined by Tim Bush, a former member of the Urgent Issues Task Force of the then UK and Ireland Accounting Standards Board. The UITF examined whether proposed accounting standards complied with company law. In 2010, Mr Bush warned that the impairment accounting rule used by British and Irish banks was not in line with company law. This year, after nine years, the Accounting Profession and the Financial Reporting Council confirmed that the standards do not fit with the law. The law is concerned with accounts underpinning what is known as capital maintenance, which includes capital solvency. At the 2015 Oroctus Bank Inquiry, Irish bankers incorrectly claimed that by law they had to conceal losses and claimed that a new accounting standard would resolve this. It won't. Instead, we have um, we could have bigger problems. Amongst the problems created are subs um, subsidies to vulture funds. Some banks claim they profited from loan sales to vulture funds. This is extremely unlikely. Thanks to flawed accounting standards, banks can bury loan write-downs into reserves and therefore record an artificial accounting profit. These transactions are potentially illegal. Um, are potentially illegal if the true subsidy is concealed. The, mass, the matter was covered in an article, Questions Raised Over 1.1 Billion Euro Loan Sale on 4th of November last year by the Financial Times. Insurance against past losses. Irish banks were not solvent on the night of the September 2008 guarantee. Unlike the Irish government, the ECB was aware of this, yet insisted that the Irish government should pay for those hidden losses. Under EU law, the Irish government is not liable. Indeed, the cancellation of the promissory notes may be illegal. Liquidity difficulties. If banks conceal their losses, it becomes impossible to borrow money. Today, banks continue to conceal losses, which makes borrowing difficult and expensive, a cost borne by current Irish mortgagers. <clears throat> Um, asset stripping. One UK bank with operations in Ireland may have pushed small but healthy businesses into liquidation by calling on loans unnecessarily. A group of small business owners gave evidence to you on this. This was partly motivated through flawed bank bonuses and incentive schemes. The UK Thames Valley Police Commissioner Anthony Stansfield has publicly expressed concern at similar practices in the UK and claims that the problem is widespread, advising those affected to read project, the Project Turnbull report which was produced by a bank whistleblower. Abuses of company law. A few years ago, a well-known company was able to split its assets into two separate companies. Investors could recognise substantial profits from the property of the company while staff and creditors were shunted into another company and were unpaid, contrary to the spirit of company law. Pension reputation. In the UK, the recent collapse of London Capital and, and Finance, Patasserie Valerie and Carillion, caused havoc 
for those in private sector pensions. UK polit politician Kevin Hollenrake MP has asked for an inquiry into compensating investors. Rights issue problems. It is difficult to see how banks can approach shareholders and investors for additional funds if they are not disclosing all of their losses. Company law prevents innocent shareholders from being burdened with losses that were concealed when they made the investment. Subsidised loans. The accounting profession may have exploited accounting standards to conceal subsidies given to developers, a matter that Deputy Catherine Murphy attempted to investigate. Um, there is the risk that IBRC exploited the accounting standards when measuring these subsidies. The solution. In April, a House of Commons report titled The Future of Audit has concluded that banks concealing losses are potentially breaking the law and that advice by the various accounting bodies, including a legal opinion which they commissioned, is incorrect. Under the capital maintenance rules, banks are not allowed to pay dividends out of capital. A 2019 case, Asset Co versus Grant Thornton, also confirms this. Tim Bush presented this in 2010 at a House of Lords inquiry and has, on behalf of the UK Local Authorities Pension Funds Forum, obtained a legal opinion from George Bompas QC, which sets out the law in a way, way such that some witness statements given to the Irish Bank inquiry were incorrect. Um, again, the 2019 case in the, High Court, in the UK High Court, Asset Co versus Grant Thornton, also confirms this interpretation of the law. When bankers appear before you, your committee in the future, we would strongly suggest that you ask them to restate their published accounts in order to comply with the law. If they do, banks will have to reveal that they were insolvent at the time of the guarantee and therefore the ECB loans will have to be reclassified as capital. This would automatically resolve the legality surrounding the repayment of promissory notes and more importantly would reveal the huge subsidies given to various vulture funds. It would also reveal the extent of asset stripping that forced many Irish businesses into failure. Um, if the banks fail to do so, they will have to come up with a legal opinion confirming that the UK House of Commons report is wrong, as is the recent admission by the ICAEW that it gave flawed advice on the concealment of losses. Under Irish company law, it remains a criminal offence to misreport the financial position. Thank you. Mr. Bush. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, Cormac Butler explains very well the defective accounting standard, which is known as IS 39. The problem started because essentially the standard was drafted to be compatible with EU law, but the detailed guidance notes, which everybody follows, which are explicit on points of details, were drafted with the United States position in mind. That obviously creates scope for confusion, and as a result, banks recorded artificial profits and pay paid flawed bonuses, even on loss-making transactions, because their profits and assets were overstated for quite a considerable period. In the UK and Ireland, this is approximately from beginning of 2005, when the standards were introduced. Um, a PDPC document from 2004 called Joining the Dots, which I attach with my evidence, correctly identified that banking regulation, known as the Basel Accord, relied on banks recognising all losses to comply with company law in the way Cormac Butler has described. It's basically what's known as the EU capital maintenance rules that apply to all companies and it ensures that banks and all companies only pay dividends out of genuine profits. It's a solvency test, basically, and it applies to every company. The Basel rules were intended to give an additional layer of protection to banks beyond what is required of normal companies, and the purpose of that was to protect the interbank market where banks borrow and lend to each other. So if you enable the inter interbank market to operate effectively, they can borrow and lend cheaply with each other. So company law was supposed to be protecting creditors and shareholders, and the Basel system is supposed to be protecting the interbank market to make them even more safer than company law was intending. And that is why banks before the crisis could borrow at cheaper rates than companies. The PwC document, though, refers to the problem with this revised standards, but draws the wrong conclusion that the Basel Accord had compensated for it, which it hadn't. At best, what Basel did was took one year's losses rather than lifetime's losses and then divided it by two for some strange reason. It assumed that half a loss could go to creditors and half to um, subordinated debt. And that's 
the technical reason because they were concerned with allowing a bank to go into runoff. So at the end of the day, banks failed to be going concerns when investors wouldn't touch them because investors eventually suspected that there wasn't capital there. And if you look at the global situation, the Ireland, the UK and the US were the worst affected um, regimes. It wasn't a global crisis. These three jurisdictions had the worst, um, what I call, ordinary lending banks as opposed to investment banks. Interestingly, um, countries like Australia introduced safeguards to counteract the problem. And Australia created an additional standard in 2006, which I've attached, which would have solved all the problems we face today that were there before and during the crisis. Interestingly as well, with the EU perspective, much of continental Europe had a natural correction as well, is they didn't permit the faulty standard in the accounts of banks themselves. It was only compulsory in the consolidated accounts of listed groups. So a French bank like Société Générale would have proper numbers in the accounts that they saw themselves as banking companies and they also had proper public accounts as well. Only the consolidated accounts would be slightly wrong. However, the UK and Ireland, um, because they're joined through having a similar accounting regime due to the Accounting Standards Board setting the standards for both um, states, didn't adjust for the defect in IS39 and it permitted IS39 to operate in banking companies as an option to using UK and Irish gaps. It was only an option. But three, and this was particularly deadly, it went a further step forward and permitted it to be used for management accounts for the banks as well. Also, as I said, although the UK and Ireland merely permitted IS39 in banking companies, rather than require, UK Irish gap would have been an option which could have corrected it. Unfortunately, the Accounting Standards Board copied IS39 into UK and Irish gap as well. So even if you prepared accounts under UK Irish gap as opposed to international standards, you'd have the same error. So that's why the banking crisis in ordinary Irish and UK high street banks and building societies was near systemic. And I say near systemic because four of the main London-based clearing banks, HBOS, Lloyds, Barclays and NatWest, which is part of the RBS group, had counteracting controls that actually did seem to make some proper adjustment despite the standards. So none of those banks actually collapsed. The problem with Lloyds was when it acquired HBOS, which was a bank which had collapsed, and the problems with NatWest weren't NatWest itself but the wider RBS group. So all, to, all, all in all, the, the big ones that collapsed were Alliance and Leicester, Allied Irish Banks, Anglo-Irish Bank, Bank of Ireland, Ulster Bank, Co-op Bank, HBOS, and the parts of RBS that weren't based in London. And we produced an analysis at the time for the local authority pension funds called Banks Postmortem, which was released in 2012. Interestingly, at the time we produced that, we couldn't understand why the Co-op Bank hadn't collapsed. And a year later it did because the Bank of England went in and discovered that its loan books were as bad as all the others. But because it hadn't got a quoted share price, the market didn't pick it up. So my simple conclusion is that accounting standard setting can't be left to the accountants. It should have legislative standards of scrutiny. Part of the reason why we're still talking about this 10 years after the crisis is people that have produced faulty accounts for banks have a vested interest in pretending that there was nothing wrong for basic strict liability reasons. The penalties on directors and auditors for producing 40 accounts are quite severe in civil law. Effectively, they owe all the losses back. So my overall conclusion is you have to have legislative standards of scrutiny of the standards when they're being set, not after they've caused the problem. And I say legislative standards of scrutiny because all these issues link with other areas of law around misrepresentation on purchase of shares, misrepresentation when people put new capital into banks, um, misrepresentation at the annual general meeting when directors want to get elected on the numbers. So in s the simplest answer would be look at what the Australians did in 2006. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Bush. Uh, Senator Conor Welsh. I'm going to thank you for your presentations. Um, I suppose at the outset, can, has anything been learned? Has anything changed? Because this kind of paints a, paints a really bad picture of where things are at. Uh, 
And I suppose what I'm concerned about is we have the banks in here time and time again. We have the central bank in here. Um, why do you think the central bank aren't addressing these matters? Because basically what you're saying is that there's liquidity problems, losses are being hidden, and we're not being given the, the true picture. So you have the different layers, then you, you have obviously the standards body, but you have the central bank, who's the regulator. But you also have the audit um, companies, the big four, and we have asked for here, in similar to Britain, for those audit companies to be uh, examined and to come before the competition authority. And that's certainly something that I feel very strongly about. So it's almost like there's a collusion there. Can you just speak to that in terms of what, what has changed? Um, thank you. It's a very good question because what struck me early on when we identified the problem back in 2009, 2010, was that one of the first people to openly speak out and not only describe the problem but describe it very clearly was Central Bank Governor Patrick Honaghan. Mm. He put it beautifully. He put it so clearly. Um, the Bank of England wasn't saying the same thing. The French banks were kind. Of, the French Central Bank was kind of saying the thing because it was in a position where it could. Um, Mervyn King, when he was then the outgoing governor of the Bank of England, started talking about it. But I think the problem the central banks have, in law, it's illegal for them to prop up a bank that is insolvent. Um, because they either lend to a solvent bank or they have to transparently put in new capital. But if they're lending money to an insolvent bank, they are effectively putting in capital into an insolvent bank. And by that, they shouldn't then be able to whip it out again. So the, the conflicts of interest that arise when a bank that is essentially bust goes into this limbo state where a central bank... Um, lends to it, creates huge conflicts of interest. It's why, in my opinion, it's best to let a bank fail, because you don't have this the sort of ongoing zombie state, living dead, where the central bank is conflicted because it's lent money to it, the auditors are conflicted because they've followed particular accounting standards that haven't delivered company law, the directors are um, conflicted because they've run a bank badly and then they've given numbers which don't show the true position. So the conflicts of interest are absolutely enormous. And Interestingly, Cormac refers to the case which settled in the High Court in London in February of this year called Asset Co. The case is Asset Co. It was a case against Grant Thornton for a company that sold buses to the United Arab Emirates. What's particularly interesting about the Asset Co case, it's the first major case against an auditor to settle in a UK court since 1968. The reason is the law is so clear that the 68 case is enough to refer to, and the um, respondents, i.e. the big four firms, prefer to settle out of court rather than having the 68 case sort of given a second lease of life. What happened in the Asset Co case, uh, they decided to take it right to the High Court, so the case was decided in the High Court, and the Asset Co case describes exactly the not only 1968 position but 1890s law because these are the same things that are around then and the law is quite shocking it's quite clear that in the asset co case the auditors owed back to the company all the dividends that had been paid off of false numbers not only that they owed all the funds that had been put into the company and were then misinvested so it's effectively the consequences of making business decisions based on the wrong numbers. It's called consequential loss. And most people, when they see the case, are actually quite shocked that that is the legal basis of settling on cases where the counts were 40. In fact, the position is so harsh, you can see why people don't want to sort of go around the street with a loud hailer telling everybody that's what their liability position is, because potentially any company where there has been misinvestment due to the numbers being wrong could follow the Asset Co case. Yeah, because you, you refer to Carillion here as well, and like the impact of... Um you know, the audit company that ruled that Carillion was in a good state of health and then we saw it was the small and medium businesses here who have really suffered as a result of that and there has been no, uh, yeah. no correct action. No correct action whatsoever and that's why at the time um, I had asked for us to, um, to have the audit companies, to have the competition authority examine the audit companies here.
do get the audit, audit companies here, one question you should ask them is, um, as a result of this asset code case versus Grant Thornton, is it time for banks to restate their accounts? Um, because if they did restate their accounts, they would have to reveal all losses. And I think what would come to light is that between 2005 and 2008, Irish banks were moving into insolvency. They had, it was a reckless period and they were giving out loans to everyone left, right and centre. So they were accumulating huge amounts of losses but were not disclosing it. Now the central bank were aware that the banks were doing this but the Irish government, officially at least, was not aware. Um, are, you, are you sure that the central bank were aware? We have documents going back to 2001. They were aware of the problems with IAS 39. Um, they raised concerns about it, but they were certainly aware of it. Um, so between 2005 and 2008, we had a situation where the European Central Bank would have been aware that banks were measuring solvency and measuring their losses incorrectly, but the Irish government was not so aware. Um, in 2008, the Irish government effectively either gave a guarantee or injected funds into the bank but the banks had suffered losses at that point. Mm. And this has caused a problem um, which um, is probably explaining why people are slow to correct this uh, issue. The problem is that once you lend money to um, an insolvent bank, you cannot take that money back out again. Uh, you must, the bank must declare that it's insolvent and then the money is distributed to um, all the creditors evenly so that no creditor is affected uh, worse than other creditors. What happened in 2008 is that many of the banks, if not all of them, were insolvent um, and the ECB had injected funds at that point. So if you think about it, the ECB made a loss at that point. Now what should have happened is the banks should have declared their insolvency and they should have looked for an equity injection. And the central banks should really have said we don't want these commercial banks to fail, therefore we need to put in an equity injection. But they did it the wrong way around, they lent money to the banks the banks delayed telling us about their insolvent situation, so they, the ECB lent money to the bank. Then the banks approached the Irish government for support and funds, and then the Irish banks admitted that they were in difficulty. How, it's the wrong way can, to do it. Can I just bring you forward? How can we identify now which banks are solvent and which banks are not solvent? Well, one rule of thumb method is to look at the um, assets which were sold to the National Asset Management Agency um, banks would not have suffered a 30, 40, 50 or 60 percent discount if they could have um, held on to the loans and, and um, serviced them themselves. And if a bank has assets on its balance sheet where they are overvalued by 30, 40 or 50 percent, you can rest assured that that bank is insolvent. Um, there are other tests, for instance, um, there was an issue surrounding burning the bondholders and some of the Irish banks took hedge funds, American hedge funds, to court. They said to the um, hedge funds, um, we have huge losses here, you should bear the burden of some of these losses. And the hedge funds more or less said to the banks, well, as soon as you declare yourself insolvent, we'll start, we'll start um, uh, admitting to the losses or accepting the losses. But of course the banks were unwilling to state that they were insolvent, but the fact that they attempted to burn the bondholders meant they felt that the bondholders had suffered losses. And if the bondholder suffers losses in the bank, it means that the bank is insolvent because it means that the assets are below the value of the liabilities. Okay, but just, so are you saying that some or all of the Irish banks are insolvent at this moment in time? You know, we, we, have, we have profits declared all of the time, we have dividends being given out now. We had Ulster Bank in here before us a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I think they have given 1.5 billion or something to, yeah. uh, to RBS. Um, are, are the banks insolvent at the moment? Um, the question you have to ask them is, are they valuing loans at their recoverable amount? And they won't be able to answer yes to that question because under the IAS 39 accounting standard and under its replacement accounting standard, banks are not required to um, value loans at, at, at uh, recoverable amount. They're allowed to use historical values. So if I lend you one million and you can only afford to repay 400,000, um, according to the current accounting rules, I show the loan at 1 million, not 400,000. Now, that is against the law because the Asset Co. Uh, Grant Thornton case says, no, you must uh, identify how much you have genuinely lost before you can start paying a dividend. Um, so the question you have to ask the various banks when they come in is, um, can they give you an assurance that all loans are never valued at above what the banks expect to recover? 
if they give you that assurance um, and it's genuine, then they're not solvent. Sorry, they're, they're, they're solvent. But if they don't give you that assurance, then they're not measuring their solvency correctly. And therefore, there could, like 2008, there could be a huge mountain of hidden losses. So what specific legislation do we need to put in place? To address the, the, ironically, the legislation is already there. It's just a question of whether the banks are complying with it. Um, the only thing I can direct you to is two report, um, the, the asset code case that um, Tim has referred to. There is also a UK report uh, that came out in February um, called The Future of Audit. And they made it clear in that report that um, the uh, advice given by some accounting professionals is incorrect. And yes. those accounting professions said it's incorrect as well. So the legislation is already there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the banks to comply with it. So do you believe we need to do a similar report here, as similar to the, the future of audit? Well, uh, do you want to have a comment? Yes, definitely. Um, <clears throat> because what was particularly interesting about the, um, the select committee of the UK Parliament that was looking at this area, they took evidence from the accounting firms on the Wednesday of that week um, where they were given the view of the law by the accountants. On the Thursday after, the asset code case settled, and by the time the committee came back on the Tuesday, they realised that there was the court's version of the law and what they'd been told the day before by the accountants. And interestingly, on the Tuesday, the French <coughs> firm Mazars appeared before them and Mazar had no inclination, they're a very professional firm, they just told the truth. So basically the whole truth and nothing but the truth came out in that session. It was quite good to watch. Clearly for historical reasons and due to EU directives, um, UK and Irish law, company law, is identical. People who are chartered accountants of the Irish Institute take exams based on the same questions, just with one paper has the UK Act reference, one has the Ireland Companies Act reference. And from talking to Cormac and looking at the two acts over the years, what's quite interesting is if somebody tries to pull the wool over your eyes, and to me, they try to read the UK Companies Act to me wrongly by misinterpreting words, whoever drafted the Irish legislation has made it clearer. So um, it's actually easier to understand the British Companies Act by actually reading the Irish legislation, because somewhere along the line, the draftsmen were better who drafted the, the Irish legislation, and it's impossible to make the same mistakes that the people who misinterpreted the English Act have done, because the Irish Act is so clearly set out, and all it needs, as Cormac says, is following the law. They won't be able to use a defence that English law is different to Ireland on this, so um, uh, if you were to examine that report, the future of audit, and um, present the findings to the bankers, um, they, would, they wouldn't be able to challenge it on the grounds that that's British law and it doesn't apply here. It does apply here. Yeah, I have looked at And just in terms of the ECB role in it, obviously the, the, the ECB have a scrutiny role in the Irish banks and the central bank here. So are they missing all this? Well, I start why, why are they ignoring yeah. this? Um, the ECB appear to be not interested in this. Um, and that's understandable because it would open up a can of worms if you think about it, when the ECB lent money to an insolvent bank, let's say Anglo, um, they're not allowed to get that money back. Um, uh, so therefore, they're not um, over-enthusiastic about um, um, measuring what's known as prudence, in other words, measuring loan losses correctly. They should be, but they're not. Um, we've put it to them, but the replies are... They take six months to reply. When they do, you see things like constructive ambiguity and confidentiality. So they're not interested in looking at it. But this is of extreme importance to Ireland because um, when you lent money to the banks in 2008, um, those banks were potentially insolvent, but you were led to believe that they were solvent. So therefore, the Irish government doesn't have a liability in respect of those promissory notes or in respect of that guarantee. And therefore, because you're paying back the money, uh, three billion a year or whatever it is, um, I think there is a question on, on the legality of whether you can pay that money back on the grounds that there was never a liability to begin with. The story would be very, very different if the Irish government knew that the banks were insolvent in 2008. Then when they put the money in, they would have known that they were putting it into an insolvent bank. 
But it's um, to I'll give you a, an example. So you're saying that the government didn't know. The government in the 2008 time. are on record as stating that they assumed that all banks were solvent, and that this would be the cheapest. Do you believe bailout. that? I would have believed it in 2008 because it wasn't well known that banks were insolvent. Um, it was only in 2010 um, when it started coming to light. And in 2010... But was there not a close relationship with the key people in the banking system well, here I, in government I, I at the time? Wouldn't, it's the, documented the, in it terms of... It could be that there was a close relationship and that they knew, but then you would have to suggest that they were telling a lie when they said that the banks were solvent. I don't think you'll be able to prove that they knew. Um, I might be wrong on that, but I don't think you will be able to prove it. What is certain is in the bank inquiry, um, um, one central banker gave evidence that he assumed that all banks were solvent in 2008 and he based, I think it was John Hurley, he based his knowledge on a PwC report which stated that all banks had sufficient capital to withstand future losses. Now, it could be that some of them said, we know this is completely false and lies, but we're going to put it out anyway. But I don't think you'll be able to come up with evidence on that. Um, in 2008, very few people knew outside of the accounting profession and outside of bankers that um, banks were, behave, were, were um, not measuring losses correctly. In fact, in 2008, the people who designed the accounting standards, the International Accounting Standards Board, gave evidence, or not evidence, but they wrote in a letter, in a prepared speech and um, a letter, that under their rules, banks are not allowed to hide losses. So they wouldn't have been able to say that if the world had known that banks were insolvent. Okay, and I just want to ask you finally, um, how far away do you think we are from another banking collapse? If I can answer that question by finishing off a little bit of Cormax as well, because the key issue about who knew what when, where I think things go wrong, was Northern Rock um, was obviously the first run on a bank in the UK for 100 years, and that was the early autumn of 2007. The day after the run on the rock, somebody in the Times wrote an article saying, oh, what if this is the same as the city of Glasgow Bank that collapsed 100 years ago? And this isn't a liquidity crisis, this is actually a capital crisis, and that's why nobody will lend to it. It's like the markets smell that there's a problem. That analysis kind of faded away, rolled back six years and the Bank of England minutes are released publicly and in that autumn uh, when the bank knows that it's lending money to the Northern Rock and the public don't know because it was private, one board member says, have we got the right numbers? Is this actually an insolvent bank or is it a liquidity problem? And again, that analysis gets pushed away because other parties are saying, no, the banks are all solvent. But again, if you've audited a bank, I think you've got an interest in saying that the bank had capital because and if you've audited 10 banks globally, you've got a major problem if you suddenly start to admit that there was a systemic problem and the banking crisis was actually a capital crisis. So it suited an awful lot of people to call the banking crisis a liquidity crisis when it was actually a capital crisis and every bank in crisis in history is effectively a solvency crisis. The, the assets are overstated and the capitals therefore overstated. So for years people were running with a red herring and what was quite remarkable in the UK, the Walker Review, um, which was done in early 2009, came up with the um, liquidity crisis uh, diagnosis. When you talk to people in the capital markets they knew that it was because they suspected that the banks were bust. I worked with somebody who was experienced enough to remember the secondary banking crisis of the um, 1970s, and he suspected it was a capital crisis in the first part of 2007. So there's a disconnect between what I call PR-based analysis and what I call proper fundamental common sense-based analysis. And one interesting um, feature of all these sort of studies and reviews during the banking crisis, the best people asking the questions and coming up with the right answers are elected politicians like yourselves asking good questions and the press. But surely governments are there to protect citizens. And, you know, it's all right, we're talking about all of this like it happened. But the, the impact on Irish citizens and the continuing impact mm. 
well, you know, in terms of vulture funds and the way the banks have behaved towards citizens, they mm. have been given a free hand by government. Well, th that's uh, correct. To do and just it, what they want. Yeah, it's. I mean, um, Tim brought this to light in 2010, um, and we're here in 2019, um, and it's only now that the accounting profession have admitted that they gave incorrect advice on the delayed recognition of losses. That's quite a considerable period of time. Um, we've had a few inquiries since, both in the UK and Ireland, um, but there's no appetite um, amongst a, a certain group of people to bring this to light. So therefore, it's, it's very important that uh, we don't have another lost decade and we do bring this to, uh, to light. What's happening at the moment, which I think you should be aware of, is um, banks are, are claiming that they're um, making profits when they sell loans to vulture funds. So mm -hmm. if you have um, a portfolio of loans worth one million, banks claim that when they sell those loans to vulture funds, they're making a profit. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're using the same accounting techniques that um, they used uh, nine years ago. And that, what they're doing is they're writing the loans down to a level that the vulture funds are willing to pay. And then um, they sell them to the vulture funds. Um, this matter came to light in an article um, by the Financial Times on the 4th of November last year um, where one bank claimed it was making a profit. But when you look through the figures and you see that um, a number of losses were being transferred directly against reserves, it was reasonable to conclude that that bank was potentially making a loss on the sale so why of the are loans. They why are they selling them if they're not making a profit? It's a, a good question because there's no concrete answer. Um, we know that there, uh, some people allege that they're put under ECB pressure to sell the loans and there is the view that vulture funds will act more efficiently than um, commercial banks but there's no um, evidence to support that. Um, we do know that the ECB is uh, um, saying to banks, if you sell loans to vulture funds, you can delay the recognition of losses on those loans as far as we're concerned. In other words, you can bury the losses into reserves. So you can actually, in some cases, record an accounting profit even though you've made a loss. Now, if you're worried about the sale of the assets to vulture funds, this is a potential defence that you can use because if a bank is selling an asset, uh, if it's a state-owned bank and it's selling an asset to a vulture fund and um, that bank is giving a subsidy, then you, the government, as government officials, are entitled to know that subsidy and therefore you can make an informed decision as to whether this vulture fund route is a, the correct route or not. And would they, could they not do the same thing if they sold the loan to, or gave a write down to the person who had the loan in the first instance? Like vulture funds, and I know from individual cases, are making enormous profits. They, they are making enormous from, profits. From so the write downs yeah. that, that, so to that they are being question, given. Mm, if they're making enormous profits, those profits should be going to Irish banks so that those profits can be used yes. to write down the customer loans. But what is happening is that. Um, they're selling them to vulture funds. Vulture funds are making a huge profit on it, and they're getting them at an, a huge discount. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, you may have remembered Project Eagle, yes. uh, which, um, a, um, a scandal which um, Mick Wallace uncovered. Basically, um, the, the controller and auditor general calculated, I think, a subsidy of about 300 million which was not disclosed by the National Asset Management Agency. But um, what the National Asset Management Agency did was wrote down the loans to what the vulture funds were willing to pay. And because the vulture funds were wouldn't want to make a profit, the loans were, were written down unnecessarily. Now, what should have happened is that um, the NAMA should have had a much more open competition to see the best price it could obtain. But they actually had a very restricted uh, competition. And the controller and auditor general was of the view that um, the price received for the NAMA sale was substantially lower. Now, if that um, scandal had been acted upon, I think many of the vulture funds sales would be questioned. Um, mm. It's hard to believe that um, vulture funds are the only competent people to uh, recover money. Uh, the Irish banks are quite capable of doing it, but because of a, of a flawed incentive, they are selling the assets to the vulture funds. They claim that the ECB are putting them under to pressure, but if you think about it, the ECB are not allowed to um, force banks to do that because mm. if you sell an asset at undervalue, there's a company law issue, you're effectively paying a dividend. Um, and because of that company law issue, a lot of disclosure is required on the true substance of the transaction and not just the artificial accounting. In a similar way, you have instances where um, 
banks um, um, set up a, a, a special com um, company. It might be the GRG or something like that. And what the banks do is um, they close down, close down a loan. They, they force you to sell an asset. Um, but this asset is dealt with through a separate company which the bank owns and that company can make a profit because it can buy an asset at a distressed price. I have seen evidence where um, an individual with a, loan port a property portfolio of 65 million um, had their assets sequestrated effectively to settle a loan worth 10 million. And um, I have fairly strong evidence that those assets were sold at distressed prices at, at relatively high discounts. What's happening when, in the case of the bank is um, they may not necessarily be recognising the loss on the loan sale, but they're recognising the profit on the distressed sale of the asset. So they're using very flawed incentive schemes uh, around these transactions, and that has to come to light because you had bankers in front of you and you correctly asked them, what discount are you giving to the vulture funds or what discounts are you giving to other people? And they said, That's, there's a confidentiality clause there, we're not going to tell you. It's extremely difficult to see how they can justify that legally because if you are the owners of the asset, you're entitled to know whether the asset has been sold at a profit or at a subsidy. And if it's been sold at a subsidy, um, then you're into all sorts of, of complications, uh, breaking the law, because you're not allowed to give a subsidy to vulture funds. So, sorry, you're entitled to know if you're the owner of the asset. So you're entitled, the asset. To, know if, you're if entitled the, to know if the bank is better off keeping the asset and earning money or selling the asset. Who is entitled to know, the, the owner well, of the asset? Well, basically, um, if you have control over a state-controlled bank, if you own 70% of the shares, let's take Allied Irish Bank as an example. If Allied Irish Bank are selling an asset to a vulture fund, you might say to yourself, well, this vulture fund is going to make a huge profit on this. Mm. So um, how much extra money would we make if we retained the assets in our own portfolio so that you can see that the bank is making an informed decision? But if the bank is using flawed accounting, you cannot see what's going on, and therefore the bank could sell the asset to a vulture fund, and um, there could be a huge discount on that asset, and an unnecessary discount. You're entitled to know that. You must know it to make sure that you, the owner of the bank, is making, uh, or, or rather the directors are making an informed decision on your behalf. Surely that's what we have a Minister for Finance and a Department of Finance for. Well, um, we, we brought this to the Minister for Finance's attention and he referred us to the IAASA, which is the Institute of uh, 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 an Accounting Body. The problem with the IAASA and the um, corporate Govern sorry, the, the uh, corporate enforcers, um, the ODCE, is that they're of the view that you can delay the recognition of losses under the accounting standards, or that you can delay the recognition of losses under the law, and that interpretation is incorrect. So um, if you said to the ODCE or the IASA, we've got a problem here, um, we first of all want to clarify whether you think it's legal to delay the recognition of losses. If they say yes, they're going to have a problem because of the asset code case. And if they say no, then they have to investigate instances where assets are sold to vulture funds. Okay, Cahirlik, I've taken a lot okay. of time, so that's it. Senator Harkin. Thanks, Cahirlik, um, and thank you both for your opening statements. Um, and I suppose just to, there are 11 members on this committee and five of us happen to be accountants, but that doesn't mean we're going to be speaking on behalf of, um, and I'm not going to be speaking on behalf of any particular body. Um, I'm just going to ask some questions relating to your opening statements. Um, the concept of true and fair view, which is, you know, fundamental to what you would have been trained to do as an accountant and a set of accounts is supposed to reflect the true and fair view, does, does the idea that you're not able, or the, the suggestion that you're saying that they're able to defer and conceal losses and record loans at amounts that are still, that are, as far as you're concerned or as far as the bank is concerned, irrecoverable, how does that sit with the concept of true and fair view? Well, the, the the purpose of the true and fair view is to effectively say, irrespective of what's written down in a codified form as to how you produce a set of accounts, common sense should prevail and you can't interpret those rules to come up with the wrong answer. You've got to deliver the right answer. And the best analogy is that if you're asked to cook an omelette and you follow a recipe and you come up with a scrambled egg, you haven't made an omelette. You've put the same ingredients in but made a mess of it. Um, what has happened in the last 20 years is that elements of the accounting profession tried to change the meaning of true and fair view to sort of whatever you wanted it to mean, a sort of a, an a la carte type of true and fair view, disconnected from 
company law. So it looks about okay, and you then speak to a few people and say, do you think this kind of accounting looks okay? And very often they wouldn't talk to qualified accountants. They'd talk to analysts or people who didn't really know what they were talking about. So you come up with what I call a distorted output that clearly doesn't give what you or I would regard as a true and fair view, that it kind of passes off. One other problem is if somebody in the Department of Finance has a technical problem, they very often pick up the telephone to one of the four accounting firms who've all got the message right, and really it's always the same person at the end of the telephone. Some of the excuses that I've come across, I can almost pin them down to the precise building because you can pick up the sort of tone and somebody wouldn't come up with the same ridiculous excuse twice by accident unless it was the same person pumping out the same um, bad excuse. So, yeah... Um, it's back, back to the I mean, I, I do accept that, you know, loan valuations, debtor write-offs in any company where you have a list of debtors, it, they're subjective. There's a level of yeah. subjectivity there that, oh, I think someone's going to pay. I mean, it's the same with inventory. You say that value is whatever, and some people say, no, it isn't. And, you know, until it's sold, you don't realise the loss or the gain or whatever it happens to be. Um, but, you know, if you're doing inventory, it's cost versus net realised of value, and you... I would have thought loans were the same. You can't have loans maintain your books. You are correct on that. Um, the, um, the, there are two um, legal opinions, um, one from George Bompas and one from Martin Moore. Um, George Bompas certainly links um, true and fair to prudence, and that broadly means you can never overvalue a loan. If you expect to recover 300,000, even though you've lent 1 million, the true and fair value is 300,000. It's not 1 million. Um, Martin Moore appears to have done so, but using very opaque English and reluctantly because he gave his legal opinion on behalf of the Accounting Standards Board. But uh, um, if you look at paragraph 71 of that opinion, he claims that prudence is an essential ingredient of true and fair view, which means that your argument that loans must be shown at the lower of what you advance the loan for or what you can recover uh, is correct. The uh, Oroctus Bank inquiry heard evidence from the accounting profession and from banks that by law they were forced to delay the recognition of losses. And that is incorrect. George Bompas disagrees with it. Martin Moore looks as though he disagrees with it. But the recent cases, the Asset Co case, um, confirms that um, your analysis is correct. And um, the um, report, The Future of Audit, which I recommend you read, also confirms that your view is, in, is correct and that the accounting profession has given incorrect advice on this. So, so, so can I just ask, what particular, you're saying by law they were told not to recognise losses? Yeah, well, in essence... What law? Yeah, well, in, um, in essence, I'll let you come in on this in a minute, but in, in essence, um, when the accounting profession devised accounting standard IAS 39, they claimed that within that accounting standard is a rule, a paragraph which stating that you, states that you can delay the recognition of losses. Now, the reason they said that is that sometimes banks were overestimating their losses, so they said if we remove that uncertainty altogether, we can solve the problem. But they've created a much bigger problem. And secondly, that paragraph, although it's in the guidance notes of IES 39, was not approved by the European Union. Um, so that is the law that they use, but that law, that report, that paragraph was not approved by the European Union. And was it approved by the UK House of Commons and by the Irish Oroctus? No, no, no. So, so are the, when you say they're laws, are they accounting well, see, rules there, or are they there laws? Is, there is confusion, and I, I, I'll let Tim come in. I know this is quite technical, but I think it, it, you're kind of saying by law they were told to do well, the opposite uh, no, of what they they're normally supposed to do. By law. They claimed that by law, but there is no law. The, the, um, what the law says is that the accountants may produce accounting standards provided they help people to comply with company law. And um, what the accountants appear to have said is, in America, they're allowed to hide losses because they have a different version of law, of company law there. They're allowed to hide losses. We'd like to have that over here, so we'll put that paragraph in. And when the accounting standard is approved, we'll um, start to hide losses. The problem is that um, they put it into the guidance notes only. Uh, in the main law, which they got approved, um, the IAS standard itself, which was approved, it didn't allow banks to hide losses. I know it gets a little bit technical. Uh, but, um, I accept that. In, I, in I'm not sure if everybody watching this will be as, was okay. as, as, well, as, as possibly yeah, uh, just, just, familiar with what's going on. But yeah, okay. uh, there is a difference between accounting standards and company law. Yeah, I mean, and accounting company, standards are the rules that the bodies mm. implement, and they, you would expect them to be trying to adhere at all times to company law, but yeah, accounting correct, standards yeah. are not law. Is it IAS 39 is the problem, or is it some, comp some bit of company law is the problem? 
and, it, and are you arguing that the IAS 39 bit that came from America or was used in America that's not approved by the European Union is the, bit, is the problem? I can actually send you a letter, which I didn't include with my evidence, from the Accounting Standards Board in April 2005 to the then Department of Trade and Industry, saying that they know what company law is, they don't agree with it because they think it's outdated, and they're setting standards that are going in a different direction, and they think the law should be changed to catch up with the standards. Well, the law hasn't been changed, so I'll supply that letter um, through, through so, the clerk of the committee. So... so the law would have would the law is not the problem. No. The, law is the not fact the problem. that the standard has said we would like to ignore a law, or else we would like you to change the law so the standard is then legal, yeah. and they just went off and ad adhered to the standard which wasn't legal, yes. as opposed to adhere to the law. So it's not the law's problem. Yeah, it's the fact that nobody um, pursued people who were breaking the law yeah. or not complying with the law. That's correct. Yeah. What, what you should read is the future of audit report because they say that the accounting profession gave the wrong advice. Uh, they were not adhering to what's known as the capital maintenance concept, which ensures that law, all losses are revealed. So they say in that report that the accounting profession gave the wrong advice. So should, should it be that the, the accountants have gone off, said we don't like the law? Is this, I'm only I'm, I'm trying to interpret your words, and you can correct me if I pick them up wrong. They, they didn't like the laws that are there. They created new standards that are in conflict with the law. They adopt, they pre prepared accounts and signed off on accounts in compliance with the standards which aren't legal. And who was then supposed to pursue them for well, preparing the accounts yeah. that were not um, prepared lawfully? The Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement. And did they ever do that? Um, we sent letters to them, but they're of the view that uh, the accounting standards do comply with the law, which is inconsistent, um, that the ODCE's view is inconsistent with the um, George Bompas opinion. It's also inconsistent with an, a recent admission by the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales, and it's also commission, or inconsistent with one of the conclusions of the future of audit. So uh, they need to be brought in and asked. Um, is your view still the same because of these developments, or has it changed? And if it has changed, they must investigate. I mean, cl clearly, as you said, there's lots of conflicts of interest and lots of vested interests mm -hmm. here. But it, it looks like that if you do something illegal, I mean, and, and then nobody stops you doing it, mm -hmm. that the regulator, you're obviously at fault for breaking the law, but equally, the regulator, who should have gone in and said, you can't break the law, you can't do this, seems to have been asleep at the wheel or or either knowingly or, I think you're suggesting knowingly, um, because there's a letter written, uh, knowingly allowed accounting firms to not comply with the existing laws and kind of make up its own rules which aren't in conflict, which are in conflict. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. And so the answer then, no, the, one of the, um, obviously it's not about changing the law because we're mm. happy with the law and we don't yeah, want the law to be changed to yeah. here with the standard where you can conceal losses. Mm. So really the problem is that corporate enforcement and the regulators are not uh, clamping down on people and is your suggestion that they are not doing it because they wanted to turn a blind eye because if they started enforcing this losses would be recognised more quickly um, and obviously there were there, eventually there was equity stakes taken in the banks but your contention is that initially there were loans followed by ultimately yeah, equity, equity participation and if you'd yeah. taken the if you'd recognised the loss mm -hmm. is immediately they were insolvent and then all of these promissory notes and all the other things that go with it would have been equity injections rather than us. And then there's a different way in terms of losses yeah. and so on. Yeah, just to summarise on that, but I think you're, you've got the point. Um, um, the, the report, the future of audits, stated that the ICAEW gave incorrect advice. And the ICAEW um, gave advice on cap, uh, which was contrary to capital maintenance and therefore contrary to, to, to and, law. And the exact bit of advice you're saying is wrong is what? That's wrong. And the ICAEW what, what, what was that made, advice? Pardon? The ICAEW have said that um, under the um, IAS 39, you can delay the recognition of losses. And, the, and they've now admitted that was wrong? They've never admitted it for and nine years. I mean, this has been write, written about, uh, Tim brought it up in 2010, and in fact he wrote to the Irish government on this. But in 2019, the ICAW, it appears to be the first time that they say that um, the accounting standard is not in compliance with capital maintenance and therefore not in compliance with company law. So they're finally getting round to saying what we've just said in the last 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, 
If I can just add, um, since these issues have been quite well aired in the UK over the last year, particularly the presence of this 2005 letter, um, the FRC is being wound up as, as a body and it's going to be replaced by something called the Auditing, Reporting and Governance Authority, which will be a properly constituted public body with a constitution set by Parliament. Because one very odd thing as well in the middle of all of this, everybody was acting as if the FRC was a private sector body, so it was on private sector wages, it wasn't subject to freedom of information, it wasn't subject to public sector um, procurement. A journalist did a Freedom of Information Act request, and the Office of National Statistics, which determines whether something in the UK is a public body, determined that the FRC was a public body in 1990, and then again in 2005. And it was acting as if it was a private sector body, and it is still in the process of implementing the necessary safeguards to be a public body with public pay, which actually means pay capping, um, not being able to use the same firms of lawyers that the accountants use. Um, freedom of information, I mean, it is quite remarkable that a body has been operating in that way for this But it, it seems that the FRC, and I think you, you, were, you were a member of the UITF, which was part of, of the Accounting Standards Board or, uh, on that, but the FRC was effectively a self-governing setup, um, paid for by the members. Is that correct? It yeah. wasn't funded by the state, or was it? It had a very small amount of residual funding from the then DTI, but the bulk of funding came from the accounting institutes and also there was a voluntary levy on listed companies. Um, a voluntary levy? Yeah, it was very interesting again. Um, it was voluntary in as much as they couldn't be sued for not paying it, but they drafted an invoice that made it look like it was compulsory to pay it, so it was a little bit of trickery going on with how we some companies were voluntary contributions it. in schools here, it sounds a little bit like that. Yeah, um, because I think if a lot of, given how bad the standards were, a lot of companies, if they thought that they were paying for this voluntarily, would rather give their cheque to Oxfam or something instead, and therefore the wording was quite um, carefully written to make it look as if they had to pay it. But was it. most of the funding from um, ICAW and people? Yeah. And what was quite interesting as well with that scheme... What was the was breakdown? Sorry, just of the, the funding from the bodies, the accounting institutes, ultimately their members, um, paid roughly at the FRC. I don't have that number relative, relative ready to listed hand, companies. I would, say it was, I would say it was somewhere between a quarter and a, th a third to a half. I mean, it was... Paid for by? The institutes. And then two-thirds from the... the yeah. Either three-quarters or two-thirds from listed companies who were doing this voluntarily. Yeah. And what kind of figures are we talking? The budget of the FRC was about 20, 20 million last time I looked. Okay. It had grown from about 2 million. So it, in the period from 2004 through to... Um, so they, the, the people setting... The, uh, the people, the Financial Reporting Council, looking at financial reports and adjudicating and getting involved, um, they were ultimately being funded by the people that they were looking at their accounts. Correct. And what was also remarkable was in the event that they find an audit firm for a problem. So, say, post Fairpack, an auditing firm would be sued a million pounds, which wasn't the amount in that case, but I just gave it as an example. The proceeds go back to the Accounting Institute, whose members it is, and effectively they get a dividend because it is deemed to be the income of the professional body whose member was fined. So that then sort of goes into the general pot and... Finds its, way, finds its way back there. But interestingly, the FRC had an agreement with the DTI whereby if it lost a court case, then the state underwrote the um, lost costs. But it kept the profits. But it kept the profits itself. It's a nice, nice business model if you can get it. Yep. Um, I'm just going to touch a little bit, I presume you're familiar with the concept of NAMA and so on. Yep. I mean, NAMA has reported profits in vertical commas if you have assets of 100 million that you write down to 30 million, 30 billion, 100 million that are written down to 30 billion before you inherit them, and then they're sold for 31 billion, the argument of NAM is that they made a profit. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the state has already picked up, or the state effectively um, has picked up the 70 billion loss in the first place. So with the reduction of the loss from 70 to 69, that's basically the same point you're making about the subsidies of vulture funds. 
isn't it? Is it that, it's, that um, what you're doing is rather than an asset being sold to a vulture, your, a vulture fund is buying an asset, they've written an asset down from 100, 100 million to 30 million, they sell it for 32 million to a vulture fund, and they say we made a profit because all of our reserves. But you're saying that the, the, they're, they're, they're then basing bonuses on the 2 million or something, but well, I, was I there not a point in time when those 70 million were hit straight yeah. into the accounts? I'll just go through, through the difference between the two because there is a slight difference. Um, obviously, when um, Irish banks were in trouble, they sold the assets to the National Asset Management Agency. Um, they might have sold them at a discount of, we'd say, 40%, which means that um, NAMA would have required 1 billion portfolio of loans for 600 million. Um, and then NAMA sells those loans on maybe for 700,000. Um, million, now, I presume. 700, well, sorry, yeah. 700 million. And therefore, NAMA make a legitimate profit there. Just NAMA make a legitimate profit. But the, if you look at the overall transaction, there's a huge loss to the state there um, of about 400 million. Um, and depending on how much of the bank we owned, whether it was 100 percent or, in the case of Bank of Ireland, less, yeah, yeah. we were taking the full yeah, hit. The, the, the state was taking. Was taking yeah, the, 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 all of us. Yeah, you know, not, you're all not, taking a full hit, even though it looked as though you were making a profit on the sale of the loan. <laughs> Now, if you take a situation where a commercial bank sells a loan to a vulture fund, the commercial bank may have a portfolio of one billion in loans. It sells it to the vulture fund for 600,000. Million? So, uh, sorry, same again. Okay, one billion sells it to the vulture fund for 600 million. Um, there's clearly a loss to the bank. Now, what the bank can do there is bury that loss under IFRS 9. It can bury that loss in reserves. So the bank doesn't have to state that it has made a loss uh, on that So it never hits the actual income profit and loss account? It never hits the profit and loss account. Um, it may do so in stages in the future, but generally it never does. Um, now, the, the problem with that is that um, if the vulture fund says you have a portfolio worth 1 billion, it's probably worth 700,000, but we'll only pay 500,000 for it. We're going um, from millions to thousands a lot. Here, sorry, okay, yeah. 1 billion, 500 million. Um, yeah. so the bank has a portfolio of 1 billion. It sells it to, it's worth 700 million because that's all you can recover. But um, the, um, it sells, that bank sells the loan portfolio to the vulture fund for 400 million. Now, um, the bank does not have to record a loss, but if you think about it, the two losses have been suffered. One is when the loan was written down from 1 billion to 700, 700 million. And did that figure make then, the profit and loss count? Um, it's, it's not very clear, but um, it may have done, it may not have done, and we have to look into the, each individual transaction. But from the 700 million to the 500 million, that 200 million would not have made it to the profit and loss account. It should do, but it hasn't. And the argument that the banks are using is that the ECB are forcing them to sell these. Yeah. Yeah. quickly to reduce mm. their NPLs. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, your, your contention is that the ECB um, want to have the loans then, but there's no well, requirement. I mean, there's a stated uh, objective of the ECB that you reduce non-performing loans, but there is only one way to reduce a non-performing loan portfolio, and that's to value them correctly. Because once a non-performing loan is valued correctly, in other words, you value it down to what you expect to get from the customer, it ceases to become non-performing, it becomes a proper loan. But what uh, the Irish banks are doing is saying, because the loans are non-performing, we're forced to sell them to the vulture funds. But it doesn't make any economic sense to do that. You're better off valuing the loan yourself correctly, down to 700 million, and then trying to recover it, rather than selling it to the vulture fund for 500 million. And would you think that the reason the banks are, are engaging in quite a lot of vulture funds is they don't want to have the reputational damage of evicting people, um, repossessing well, houses and all that. I, I don't think that that's the motivation because if you think about it, um, when banks sell loans to vulture funds, they suffer a huge reputation at yeah. the point of sale. So I don't think that's the motivation. But not on an individual house by house, transaction by transaction basis. They've kind of deferred no, all that I mean, grief if, at a personal level. Got a so what's the, what, what's what is the motivation for a bank which, sorry, selling sorry. an asset of 700 million for 400 million? Okay. Well, just on, on, on the first point, if you get a letter from a vulture fund stating that your bank has now transferred your loan to a vulture fund, you're going to have a negative reputation towards that bank. You're, you're, you're but less than if people you. turn up in yellow jackets and evict you. Pardon? Less than if people turn up, turn up in high-vis jackets on a Sunday morning and evict you. Well, I mean, the, the selling, if, if you receive a letter from a vulture fund saying we, we now own the loan, that's as, nearly as stressful as an eviction. It's not quite there. But the, the point is I don't think they're doing it for reputational reasons. Um, unfortunately, the um, ECB have allowed banks to, to, when they sell assets to vulture funds, to bury the loss into reserves. So therefore you don't have to give details of the loss that you've suffered.
Um, and then they, they, ECB have a policy of reducing non-performing loans, and they seem to have taken the view that when, when assets are sold to vulture funds, the non-performing loans are reduced. But um, it's not a correct approach. It's the approach that people are doing, but it's not the correct approach. But the motivation, if, if I'm a banker and I'm a chief executive of a bank, mm. I've, I've taken the hit from a billion to 700 million. Yeah. It's sitting in my books at 700 million. I mm. think it's recoverable at 700 million. I'm yeah. selling it for 400 million mm. just because the ECB says. Well, some banks actually record a, 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 an accounting profit, now a pure accounting profit, on the sale of assets to vulture funds. So that might be a motivation. But, but how do you record an accounting profit if you've lost 300 million? Well, to give you a very simple example, and this is the same as Project Eagle, you have a portfolio of 1 billion in loans. Um, you write it down to 380 million and then sell it for 400 million to the vulture funds. So you never took the 620 hit in your... No, not in the profit uh, but and loss you, account. But it's you can manage to take the 20 in the profit and loss you account? You take the 20 to the profit and loss account, yes, which is crazy. And nobody in ODCE, nobody in the accounting bodies, uh, nobody in, is, is saying it's okay to recognise the losses to the profit and loss account, but it's not okay to... I mean, that's opposite to anything that I ever learned well, in my training. It, it is. And, and I would and say um, that any other the member... The only thing I can do is recommend you that you read the article on the 4th of November in the Financial Times... Uh, it gives an indication of a bank yeah. recording an accounting profit where um, it um, has transferred 300 million to um, reserves, which is effectively a loss. Okay. Um, obviously, your contention is that the liquidity issue, which was the argument at the time, I think back at the time of the guarantee, was it wasn't a liquidity issue, it was a solvency issue. Was, and, well, the bank, and the minister and the government were told by the banks it was a liquidity issue. And I'm not, I wasn't a member of the bank inquiry, I wasn't a member of these houses when it was on, mm. but they were told. They were told it was a liquidity issue when it was really a solvency mm -hmm. issue. And your contention is if it was a solvency issue, well then all these promissory notes are... It's, it's illegal to repay them because you don't have a liability. The best example I can give you is if you go for health insurance, um, um, you, you pay a premium and that protects you against something that's going to happen in the future. But if you have already got a health condition which you have failed to tell the insurance company, then the insurance company cannot be liable for the health condition that you've already suffered. And it's the same with, with um, the guarantee. The government gave a guarantee against future losses. They didn't give a guarantee against hidden losses. And a lot of the promissory note repayments relate to losses that were accrued up to 2008. So the health condition existed at that point. And therefore, when the government repaid the funds, they're not c cancelling an existing liability because there's no liability to begin with. And your contention is that the government probably didn't know about the solvency crisis it, it was told it was a liquidity crisis and mm. accepted it, yeah. but that the ECB did know yeah. that well, there was the a solvency ECB, crisis. As I pointed out, there is a letter in around 2001 and 2003 where they're aware of the weaknesses of the accounting standard. And um, Brian Lenehan said that the guarantee in 2008 would be the cheapest bailout in the world, um, which indicates that he hadn't intended to um, bail out past losses. Um, there was a report from PwC confirming that all banks had sufficient capital to absorb, to withstand future losses, which was an indication that all the banks were solvent. Um, and there was an admission made in the bank inquiry that um, when, they were measuring, when the accountancy firms were measuring solvency, they didn't take into account losses that they were not allowed to recognise under IAS 39, which effectively means that solvency was measured incorrectly. So therefore, the repayment of the promissory notes, um, um, when you um, authorise a cheque for the three billion repayment or whatever way it's done, you're not extinguishing an existing liability. You're giving money away that's not due and payable. And obviously it's in the ECB's interest that it is repaid, because if it, wasn't, if it wasn't yeah. repaid, yeah. they'd be at the loss they rather than the state would be at the loss. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a final point on, on the asset stripping. I mean, we had evidence in here, particularly in relation to the GRG, that mm. um, this GRG organisation was set up um, to allegedly help their customers and bring them through things, but actually became very difficult and um, businesses were lost and planning permission. They just took over the business, made it so difficult to run that then they repossessed them and sold them. Have you much evidence of that happening? I have quite a lot of evidence. Um, we have to bring it down to concrete evidence, to looking at the letters and seeing the link. But what I've seen so far is, if you were a small business in Ireland and you had property, uh, normally you would be given loans on a term basis. That means that um, if you have a property, you're given a loan for 20 years and you pay part of the interest in principle. Um, some of those small business owners were given letters stating that the, under the new facilities the loans would be on demand 
rather than uh, for term. Um, and then when these loans were um, transferred to um, um, the recovery groups, the recovery groups were free to, to go in and um, say to the bank, we want, or rather to the customer, we want all our money tomorrow. If you don't, we'll have to sell your assets. So the contention basis. is that the bank was probably wrong, was definitely wrong to have given those letters, but equally the customer should have picked well, up on that is, at the this time. This has been an issue that was picked up in, in, in both the UK and Ireland. Um, it's wrong to change uh, a term loan to an on-demand loan. Um, it's simply okay. illegal. But th there is a second point there. A lot of these companies were sold what are known as hedge products. Um, and they ended up, um, what, what happened was, um, I'd give you a loan for 20 years, and then I'd say it's going to be an on-demand facility, but um, I want you to take out a fixed rate, rate swap with me. Um, and you might sign up to that, not fully understanding what was going on. The problem is that if, you, if I give you a fixed rate swap on an on-demand facility and interest rates go against me and in your favour, I could say to you, the loan is on demand, so therefore we're cancelling the loan. We want the money in tomorrow and therefore the swap is cancelled. So it was a one-way bet for the bank. The bank would either make money if interest rates went down, but not lose money if interest rates went up. So there was mis-selling. The consequence of that is that all these small businesses were paying more interest than they should, and that increase in interest pushed them into bankruptcy. It's a bit like the tracker mortgage. Once they went into GRG, they were subjected to a management fee, and they were also exposed to restrictions. Um, so some people were told you can't sell this asset. You, um, even if you sell something like a car, you need our approval. And there is the risk that they might delay that because they wanted to create a distressful situation. And then, I mean, you've, you've outlined a solution here. It, I mean, the solution, it was a case that accountants went off, didn't comply with the law, and everyone turned a blind eye. Well, yeah, the solution, broadly speaking, is that you get the bankers in front of you here and the accountants and say, do you have a problem with Asset Corp versus Grant Thornton? Do you have a problem with the future of audit? Do you have a problem with the admission by the uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales? If they say no, then you have to say to them, right, we want you to uh, restate your accounts so that all losses are revealed. Now, if they do that, they show their true solvency position. And a few consequences can arise from that. First of all, it would be very obvious if they were insolvent in 2008. If they were insolvent in 2008, <coughs> there is a question mark over the repayment of the promissory notes. Secondly, um, if loan, if um, customers, um, if I had a loan um, with a bank, and that, uh, the bank sold, uh, called in the loan and sold the asset on a distressed basis, uh, it would become very obvious that they were doing things like that if they prepared their accounts correctly. Um, and uh, in relation to the vulture funds, they would have to reveal the subsidy that they gave to the vulture funds because they were using correct accounting rather than artificial accounting. So it would solve numerous problems. Um, and I think an opportunity did exist with Project Eagle um, where there was subsidies given, somebody should have said, well, okay, we, we, don't, we don't want this to happen again. We're going to have to put a corrective procedure in place. If they had, I think that uh, we wouldn't have as many sales to vulture funds today. And I can just, in, in conclusion, if, if people had actually stayed, stuck to the basics of true and fair view, recording things at recoverable value, um, which was the basic prudence principle, uh, one of the four, uh, principles in terms of accounting that, we, that you learn on your first day probably doing it, yeah. and going concern and so on, um, we, it, we, would be, be we would never place. have been in the situation yeah. we were in. Yeah, they should have taken the hit when it was realised yeah. and then we wouldn't have had all these promissory note issues and so if, on. If and that, I think I've probably taken up enough of everybody's time, so <laughs> just to thank you both for your, okay. your points and thank you, Chairman. Yeah, that's very much, Chair. I'd like to, to welcome Mr Butler and uh, Mr Bush. I, I apologise for being late, so if I repeat any question that's already asked, just just let me know, Chair, and I'll, I'll uh, desist. Um, just a few a few questions, if I may. Um, just, Mr Butler, in relation to NPLs, I think you said there that if they were, if they were valued correctly uh, by the banks on their balance sheets, that there would be no need to, to offload them uh, and to sell them as such. Mm -hmm. So is it your understanding of the the technical definition of an NPL under the, the EBA and so on, that if they are valued correctly or if the provision made is adequate, that they are removed from the NPL classification on the bank's balance sheet? Um, I can't say that for definite because the um, uh, non-performing loan rules, that they, they've changed quite a lot. Yeah. Um, but the, the issue is that uh, if, you, um, if I give you a loan and you're on a salary of 100,000 and suddenly your salary goes down to 30,000, 
I'm clearly not going to be able to recover that. So I have yeah. to ask myself, if I gave you a loan today, what's the maximum I would give it to you for? And then write down the loan by that difference. Now, it be becomes a performing loan. Um, the EBA, in their definitions, might say, well, this customer did default because if you can look at the original term sheet, uh, they're not meeting that. So therefore, it could be an NPL loan by definition. Um, but that, the EBA definition shouldn't come into play the question is, uh, what you should be doing here in Ireland is saying that if we can't recover the full amount on a loan, it's non-performing, yeah. and therefore we have to value it down. If we can recover it, then we leave it alone. But it should be that simple. Um, and trying to get into EBA definitions sure. would create more confusion. <coughs> Okay, uh, but I suppose that's what the uh, that's what the regulator is working to. The it, it is what the regulator is working to, but um, the, there are regulators do. Uh, um, I don't know how strictly they are enforcing the EBA definition, but uh, if you think about it, um, once a loan hits the recoverable amount, once the value hits the recoverable amount, and the customer is willing and able to pay at that new basis, it should be classified as performing. Okay, so you, in your view, the requirement for extra capital to be put aside for that loan, if it has been correctly provided for a revalue to its, yeah. its real value, mm -hmm. there should be no requirement for extra any, capital yeah, exactly. to be put aside. Now, having said that, when you revalue the loan downwards, you're going to lose money, and therefore that's going to eat into yeah. your capital. But um, once that's done, there shouldn't be a need for extra capital. Yeah, yeah. I think the, uh, it's something we'll, we'll tease out further, but um, I think that under, under the EBA's rule book as such, it doesn't become not non-performing, mm. uh, even if there is an adequate provision. And that's one of the reasons why the banks know, well, are selling see, these on, which the, the, I don't agree with. The problem with, with the, that uh, you yourself have to face with, sometimes the EBA uh, and the ECB have rules that are inconsistent with common sense. Um, and they, um, in terms of non-performing loans and so forth. Sure. Um, but sometimes the regulators under Pillar 2 are given facilities to um, correct those defects, so you should look out for those opportunities. Sure. Just in relation to the UK House of Commons Committee report, um, and if you've addressed this already, fair enough, but the, the, the potential breakup of the big four from an auditing perspective, is that a recommendation that you would agree with, either of you, or what's your view on that? Yeah, the that, that the consulting businesses are being used as cash cows as such yeah. uh, and should be separated. The UK House of Commons supports that and the recommendation is actually being put into regulations for consultation by the Competition and Markets Authority. Yeah. Um, so I think most people who have what I call an investment interest in a company would support the separation of the two functions so that auditors go back to doing what they ought to be doing, which is auditing for yeah. the shareholder, creditor and public interest, and consulting is something different. Um, but also the future of audit inquiry is looking at that as well, because there is a school of thought that people don't find auditing an interesting career if they hear a message that the consulting side of the firm is more interesting and it's kind of propping up the audit side. It's, uh, mm. it, 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 it's a relatively recent um, phenomenon to have that kind of consultancy mindset and it has corresponded to what is quite clearly a decline in standards of audits of company accounts that have reached the proportions they have where companies like Curlian suddenly disappear overnight even though the warning signs were there easily five or six, seven, eight years ago. And do you think that that is an issue that should be on the agenda in Ireland as well? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. The, the breakup of the big four? Absolutely, because I think the, 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 the best indication of the effectiveness of the recommendations of Parliament and the um, Competition and Markets Authority is the extent to which the big four are lobbying against it. They will open their mm. sentences by saying that they um, support some of the recommendations or they, they, they welcome the report, but when it gets down to it, they don't like it. One of the, my understanding is that one of the big four wants to take it to, to, to judicial review to actually challenge the split. Okay. Okay, can I ask either of you uh, what your advice is to this committee as to what we should do? So you have um, you've made your opening statements, you've engaged in, in questioning. The committee can do further work examining a lot of what's on the public record, and I think you, you've agreed to send on uh, some further correspondence as well. But where would you suggest that this committee go with all of this uh, material, and who should we now be engaging with? Is it IASA? Uh, is it the ODCE? Uh, is it the prescribed account? bodies, the central bank, the Department of Finance. It is, it is quite a technical area. We might have a reason
reasonable understanding of it, um, but we need, to, we need to engage expertise to tease this out properly. My, my, my first comment would be to try to compare notes with the politicians in Westminster on the committee okay. who've come to a view, and they've come to a cross-party view. It, 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 it transcends political parties because they see the effect it has on the people they represent. Um, the interesting thing is a lot of the disinformation that's been passed around in various sessions of this House and Westminster is the same stuff being sort of recirculated that they've seen through and yourselves have seen through. I would certainly compare notes. And the other reason why I would is we did an analysis of what we called the banking crisis in the UK and Ireland because I think a lot of people don't realise that sitting underneath RBS is Ulster Bank. Um, sitting inside the Bank of Ireland is a whole load of business in Ulster to the extent that it even issues the banknotes in pounds for um, the North. Um, HBOS had enormous um, holdings in um, loans in the Republic. So the, the, the banking system of the UK and Ireland is amazingly intertwined. Um, so I think some sort of communication between the two islands would be beneficial because both are suffering yeah. from except effectively the same disease. Okay, so for us to engage with that committee in the first instance, um, you believe would be a good step. The, the second thing you could do is, um, I mentioned this before, but just, just to recap, when the banks are before you, um, ask them whether um, the report on the future of audit is correct or incorrect, whether they agree with the Asset Co versus Grant Thornton judgment, okay. um, and whether they agree with the George Bompas opinion or not. Um, if they agree with all those or if they raise no objections, then they're of the view that it's not legal to delay the recognition of losses. Therefore, they will need to restate their published accounts. How far back would they need to restate them? Well, it's automatic. I mean, once they agree to the restatement, they will have to um, look at uh, the instance where um, they borrowed money from the ECB while they were insolvent um, and then restate their capital. So in theory, they have to go right back to 2005, but there are much easier ways to, to deal with it. But the first thing is to get an admission that the published accounts may not be correct and then to look at the consequences of that. Um, if the published accounts are not co are, were not correct, it follows that the repayment of the promissory notes is mm -hmm. not necessarily legal. It follows that the subsidies to, given to the vulture funds will come out uh, in the open, and therefore there's a question mark as to whether the vulture funds should have got involved in Irish operations. Um, and in relation to people who um, have suffered small business owners who have seen their loans, uh, their businesses collapse, it will be obvious um, what the assets were sold for and whether the bank made a profit on, on those particular transactions and therefore okay. you'll be able to see the conflicts of interest. And is your core point there that the banks should not have been given the ELA, the emergency liquidity assistance, by it, uh, the euro system, by the ECB, yeah, because it, they were actually insolvent, yeah, that's they correct. hadn't been recognised yeah, the losses, and therefore by extension um, the, the promissory note cancellation, in your view, could be challenged. Well, yeah, just to put that into to, uh, very plain English, yeah. um, in 2008 uh, the banks were insolvent. Uh, the, the central bank had already lent money up to that point, therefore the central bank had suffered a loss at that point. Now what happened was everyone said there's a liquidity crisis mm. and not a solvency crisis. So they got the Irish government to put money into the banks and then that money went to the ECB. What should have happened is the ECB should have said these banks are insolvent, they need an equity injection. So once we put the money in, we can't take it out again. Um, and uh, if that correct procedure had been carried out, um, the Irish government would not have been exposed to this huge liability. And therefore the repayment of the promissory notes as they are as you're, as they're taking place today are not cancelling the liability, they're effectively giving a present to the ECB. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's what you need to solve. Finally, then, just to get your views on the, the regulatory architecture in Ireland now in relation to accounting and auditing. So, as you mentioned a while ago, we have the Irish Auditing and Accounting Supervisory Authority, um, which I think involves ministerial appointments. The prescribed accountancy bodies uh, are represented on it as well. And as I understand it, that body's, uh, IASA's role as such is to oversee um, the, the regulation by the prescribed bodies of the profession as such. Um, so your views on that and then in the context of the EU's directive um, on audit regulation. So. Uh, what are your impressions and your views on that structure that's here, and is it working, is it deficient, and what should change? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that is really anomalous 
is the, the extent to which the UK and Ireland were intertwined within the FRC structure because the objective of the FRC was to effectively oversee the professions despite the fact that in Ireland things operate on pre-1920s sort of boundaries. The, the, the North and the South are just treated as one. Therefore, the UK and Ireland was treated as one. And there was this bizarre anomaly that the Auditing Practices Board, of whose sort of chairman is appointed by the Secretary of State in London, was issuing guidance on how to audit the Central Bank of Ireland. I mean, it was astonishing when you see these pieces of paper coming out of London telling um, auditors in another state how their central bank should be. Um, audited. I mean, it was quite remarkable. I think some of that has been pulled out, but there are still um, anomalies in there where things happening in London are having a direct effect in Ireland without any real sense of accountability at all. One reason why, when I was on the Urgent Issues Task Force, I wrote to um, the late Brian Lenehan was because I was aware I was on a committee that was affecting two yeah. jurisdictions and I thought it was only right that I showed a degree of accountability to both states rather than the one I happened to be born in and lived in. Maybe just tell, t tell us and tell people watching uh, who is the regulator of the accountancy profession and the auditing profession in Ireland as you see it. It would be still unfortunately the accounting profession. The Institute of Chartered Accountants Ireland sets the accounting standards by basically copying the outputs of the FRC, it franks them as Irish GAP. Um, there's the Irish Auditing IASA. Authority. Mm. There's also this body called the Director of Corporate Enforcement, DC, which yeah. should be policing yeah. company, company law, law. Yeah. Um, which is quite a tough nut to crack given that um, there seem to be so many breaches of company law. Um, I think what you need to have is some architecture that delivers what's there in company law. But are you well, describing it as self-regulated, essentially? It is effectively self-regulated, yeah. yeah. I think they would dispute that, but that, yeah, that's your read of it. Yeah. One thing I'd like to add on this is that um, the IAASA and um, the ODCEE are on record as stating that their interpretation of the law is that banks can delay the recognition of losses under IAS 39. Therefore, they can't operate as regulators because if that's their interpretation, they can only penalise bankers who um, are not following the, the, their interpretation of the law. This came up with the Financial Reporting Council. Um, they have been accused for letting major disasters go unchecked. Um, and um, because they're on record of stating that uh, banks are allowed to delay the recognition of losses, they become ineffective as regulators. So. Um, I, I, I won't go into the engineering as to whether they should, should be self-regulation or not, but uh, one point I'd like to make is that um, if they hold this view, they can't operate as regulators. If they are told um, that, uh, that the law says you must recognise all losses and therefore you penalise any banks that don't recognise losses, they would be a lot more effective. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. McGrath. So just rising from that um, exchange, or the exchanges up to now, I think it's clear um, that we would like to see the banks maybe responding uh, to today's meeting, um, perhaps sending them the transcript of the meeting and ask them for their response. Um, I certainly would uh, invite you to, uh, with the support of the members here, uh, to set out the type of questions that you believe we should be asking the banks. You have done in your, in your evidence to the committee. Uh, but to formally put the list of questions that you believe are relevant uh, for the past, present and future, so that we can be absolutely clear of what we need to ask them. And again, with the permission of the committee, we might look at the ODCE and these regulatory bodies, see can we uh, invite them in and uh, respond uh, to the transcript that they will get. Uh, and, and take it on from there, if that's agreed. Um, to go back to your, your um, opening statement and to the exchanges, the question arises for me uh, is, what did you think of the banking inquiry? Well, I start. 
Um, yeah, the bank inquiry um, was helpful in that the bankers did admit that they concealed losses or they delayed the recognition of losses. They say that they were well aware of the problems with IES 39 but went along with it. Um, so that part of the um, inquiry was very helpful because you have factual information and evidence and all of this evidence was given under oath which makes it um, very, very, very helpful. Um, the part of the inquiry I didn't agree with were those witnesses who said that under law they were forced to delay the recognition of losses. Uh, it's now clear that uh, the IAS 39 standard, if it's interpreted that way, it's interpreted incorrectly. Um, and um, it was known all along by many people that you cannot um, um, fail to comply with company law if you think it's an accounting standard says you can go in another direction because the role of the accounting standards is to help people to comply with company law so you can't rely on, a, on an accounting standard alone to justify the delayed recognition of losses they have made um, they, they have claimed that the law is there and that they are allowed to to, to do so and that's incorrect so um, they say that you shouldn't go back to the inquiry because everything has been done and conclusions drawn, but it's very clear now that their conclusions on the delayed recognition of losses in terms of the law is incorrect. But therefore the conclusions of the banking inquiry were incorrect, if, if the banking inquiry in fact drew conclusions, because they were basing it on incorrect information from banks and did not take into consideration perhaps couldn't have had because it only came to light recently yes in the last well, well no it would have come to light um, in in 2010 as tim will explain um he um um blew the whistle on this uh, delayed recognition of losses and he uh, got a uh, legal opinion which i'll let you explain in a sec from martin moore qc and he agreed um, that you cannot delay the recognition of losses so the, the witnesses at the bank and inquiry should have been aware that under company law you can never misrepresent your financial position. They should have, the uh, witnesses should have been aware of that. They um, said to the committee, no, the law is that you, you can hide losses. Um, it's, uh, it's yeah, not but they were wrong in that. Oh, yeah, they were definitely wrong. Yeah. The so they misled the, the committee. Yeah, they misled the committee. But the trick of these um, inquiries is to look at the evidence, not necessarily at the conclusion. And the helpful part of the evidence is that they admitted that they were hiding losses. The unhelpful part is their interpretation of the law. So overall, the, the, they drew the wrong conclusion. But there's quite a lot of evidence. Do you view on the banking inquiry, Mr. Bush? No, because I didn't look at it in enough detail. The only observation I have had is that if you tell them there's a defective standard and they effectively get to a point where they've admitted it, they always then say, well, it's about to be changed or it's about to be fixed, and that never happens. So um, I don't think they've been as clear as they could have been, given the seriousness of the problem that's actually being looked at. Or hoodwinked a little bit. Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, then it comes to the evidence given today. And I want to say to both of you that... I'm not an accountant. Uh, I've been in different small businesses all my life. And I have to say, it angers me greatly to hear your account of things. And while you might think it's technical and so on, it's easily understood. When you're robbed, you know you've been robbed. And to be robbed over and over again, I think, is utterly incredible. Because the banks can hide their losses, they can get away with paying taxes, they can use vulture funds to uh, do all sorts of things, you know, that they can't do, treat people badly and so on. And then you have the whole issue of the GRG type uh, situation, where businesses were destroyed that should not have been destroyed, it would appear. That, that, that's essentially what you're saying. And you, you in particular, uh, Mr. Um, Butler, have, have set out in stark terms the wrongdoings of the state and the banks in relation to all of these issues. And you're standing over everything that you uh, say, and Mr. Yeah. Bush, I presume you're standing yeah. over everything yeah. that you say. And if only half it is true, it, it, it begs some sort of intervention from the state, from the government, 
Would you agree with that? Yes, uh, because um, uh, Anthony Stansfield... We're paying back a debt we shouldn't be paying back. You're certain, certainly, in my view, paying back a debt you shouldn't be paying back. And we're imposing austerity on people mm. in, in, um, in the pursuit of repayment of that debt. Yeah. That, the, that we shouldn't be doing. Yeah, that's correct. And um, for the small businesses who have suffered, um, there's always the argument that if there's a wrongdoing, they can take the, the bank to court. But as Anthony Stensfield, the police commissioner in the UK, has said, that's not an option open because the banks will always outlaw yeah. the individuals. Right. So uh, in those it's cases... It's certainly not an option in the Irish courts no, it's anyway. Not. So therefore there is... They um, seem to have a particular uh, view of the banks. We're not supposed to comment on the courts, but... Uh, that's my view. Um, so you're going to provide us with the information and maybe provide us with some sort of a roadmap as to what direction uh, we should take. Uh, the letter that you sent to the late Brian Lenehan, is that a letter that we should have? Yeah, I'll, find that. Yeah, I'll see if I can find the response as well somewhere. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if you would. We might be looking back on things, but I'm afraid that in looking back uh, we have to learn. And the other issue is that uh, we're paying for it still. Um, I just want to check if there's any uh, other issue that uh, I want to raise with you before you go. Uh, I think we, the committee is aware of most of what you've been saying uh, in the context of, of the general trust of your, your submission, Mr Butler. And likewise with you, Mr Bush, I think maybe we should meet our, uh, the, the uh, committee uh, in, in the UK and see can we uh, further uh, a joint approach maybe. Um, just one general question to finish then. In auditing the, the books of banks or businesses or anything else, isn't there an obligation on all of these auditors to tell the truth? Yes, it's known as the true and fair concept. Yeah, not you, just as they yeah. see it. But yeah. No, you, you can't follow a pattern or, or a checklist. You have to make sure that the financial position of the bank is correctly portrayed. Um, so they, they too were wrong? They too were wrong, yes. And you'd stand over that? I'd stand over that. So I'd, and will you come back to the committee again if required, both of you? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think you've done a, a wonderful job of presenting the overall story, and I think it would be up to the political system now to respond uh, to what you have said and in order as, uh, to repeat myself but in order to get clarity I think the transcript needs to be sent to the banks to the minister uh, to the accounting bodies wherever they are uh, for their response and then we need to take the further action that we've generally agreed on now that we talk about again uh, to, to finalise. Okay. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much for coming along. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. The 30th of May at 10 a.m.